There is an element shortage affecting the world, and yet, as Gary here will illustrate, the law of conservation of mass would make you wonder why that is. All right, I've got a handful of helium balloons here, and no matter what I do, the helium sticks around. I could let one go, but I'm not going to, because that's not good for the environment. I can pop one, or I can inhale what's inside. The helium isn't destroyed, it's just spread around a bit. There's as much helium around as when I started, yet some say the world is running out of helium. Well, it's not easy to destroy matter. You can't do it with ordinary chemistry. Yet some scientists say, as Gary said, the world is running out of helium, which seems bizarre given that one fourth of the universe is helium. The shortage has implications far beyond keeping children's birthday parties uplifting. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Shostak, and welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this show, the case of the disappearing elements. The world seems to be light on helium. We'll find out where it's gone, and also why the Earth's atmosphere lost at least half of its nitrogen billions of years ago. But it's not all about elements going AWOL. There are cases of dramatic appearances, from the great global oxidation event to the brief debut of four brand new elements. Given that matter can't be easily created or destroyed, we'll find out what or who is responsible for these chemical comings and goings. It's elements never forget. Let's go back inside. I'm feeling lightheaded. Sure, when you think of helium, you probably think of colorful party favors. But helium has been filling more than balloons for the vast majority of its history, which, by the way, began with the Big Bang. During the first three minutes of the universe, the Big Bang created hydrogen and helium, and, well, basically, that was it. It would have been a cinch to memorize the periodic table 13 billion years ago. I mean, there were only just two elements. Humans identified helium only in the 19th century, when a French astronomer measured a funny yellow line in the sun's spectrum, and he called this new substance helium, after the Greek word helios for sun. A year later, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev published his famous periodic table of the elements with about 60 entries. Number one in the table was hydrogen with one proton in its nucleus. Number two, I'm number two, I'm number two, was helium. Helium is still being cooked up in stars. One fourth of the universe is helium. And yet some scientists, such as Ina Vishek, a postdoctoral fellow in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, claim we're running out of it. If so, it's a serious problem because helium is necessary for some medical devices, such as MRI machines. Ina, there's been a back and forth public debate about whether we're running out of helium. And you took the time to respond to this concern directly on Quora.com and address questions such as, are we really running out of helium? What answer did you give to that? Yes, we really are. Well, well, elaborate when you say we're running out of helium. I mean, I can still get it for my party balloons. Yes, you can, and I can still get it for my lab. But this is sort of an inherent issue. So helium, it's the second most abundant element in the universe, but on Earth, it's actually a scarce and non-renewable element. So all of the helium on Earth comes from radioactive decay of uranium and thorium. These are heavy elements that sometimes break apart into lighter elements, including helium. And this helium is then extracted from natural gas mines where it's found in very small percentages. And once it's released into the atmosphere, the atoms are so light that eventually they escape into outer space. Well, so what you're saying is that the helium that we you know, collect uh, out of, I don't know, gas wells or wherever we're collecting it from, that that's helium that's actually been made inside the Earth as these heavy radioactive elements decay. Just natural radioactivity is making a little bit of helium? Absolutely. So the half-life of the most common isotope of uranium is over four billion years. So it takes a really long time to actually make the helium that we have on Earth. 
Well, why are you fielding these questions on a website? I mean, uh, you obviously feel strongly about this problem, and is that because of a you know personal interest in helium, or simply the seriousness of the situation? Just being able to do your own research. What what is it that motivated you to go public about helium? Well, there is some personal interest. So uh, for my own research, I use liquid helium as a cryogen, and that is one of its important uses. It is the element that can reach the lowest temperature of any other element. And its cryogenic uses are actually not just for uh, physics experiments. Actually, the largest cryogenic use of helium is in magnetic resonance imaging. So when you go to the hospital and get an MRI, it is a superconducting electromagnet. And that device is cooled down by liquid helium. Well, let me ask you, how cold does that get? I mean, liquid helium, what temperature is that? So it is 4.2 Kelvin, which is minus 452 Fahrenheit. For comparison, that is just a tiny bit warmer than interstellar space. Okay, so I'm hearing that we're running out of this helium. It's useful for at least MRI and maybe many other things, which I'll ask you about. But I mean, why don't we just make more helium? If we we use hydrogen a lot in the, in the lab and elsewhere, and we just make more hydrogen. I mean, you can make more hydrogen. You could you know even make it from water if you really have enough energy. So why don't we just make more helium? Well, helium and hydrogen are a little bit different. So hydrogen is a reactive element, which means it can react with other elements to make new compounds. And a lot of the hydrogen that's on Earth is trapped in other compounds, such as water and hydrocarbons and all kinds of things. So helium is non-reactive. So it's always just helium. Once it's released to the atmosphere, it can't react with another element, and it just eventually escapes into space. Now, are we storing this helium in, you know, big containers somewhere? Because clearly it's considered an important element. Do, do we store it somewhere? Yes. So we have been storing helium since 1960 in a Federal Reserve near Amarillo, Texas. But in 1996, this uh, reserve was over a billion dollars in debt, so they decided to basically sell off the helium. And that's where a lot of problems started. So as they were selling off the helium, this had a negative effect on the price, namely making it cheaper in such a way that doesn't reflect how scarce the resource is. So there was quite a big crisis in 2006 and 2007, where some glitches in the global supply caused the prices to spike. And because the reserve was being depleted, actions could not be taken to counteract that. So in 2013, Congress passed the Helium Stewardship Act of 2013, which made it so the government would play a role in managing helium resources. But it's controversial whether it's doing what it should. Well, okay, so the, the government is back in the helium storage business, to hear what you just said there. Uh, but can you give me some idea of, you know, how much more do we need? I mean, obviously you could give me maybe a number in terms of like, cubic feet of helium we need or something like that, but I, I'm not sure that would mean much to me. But maybe you could say as a percentage of the, the helium that we got stored in that uh, storage tank, wherever it is, uh, you know, how much more do we need? Do we need another percent? Do we need twice as much? Do we need a thousand times as much? So the way I would answer your question is, how many years do we have if we continue using helium at this rate? based on how much we have both in mines that we know are there, in mines that we think are there, and also in storage. And we have about a century left. About a century. That, that, that doesn't sound very long to me. Let, let's get into the question of, you know, what it's used for. I mean, we kind of touched on that. Uh, the MRI machines in hospitals, for example. What are other uses of helium? Well, helium has a number of very special properties. So we already talked about its property of being able to reach very low temperature, but its other important properties are, first of all, it is inert. It doesn't react with anything. And secondly, it is very light. So the property of being inert is perhaps the most useful one. So this is used in many applications where you need some sort of atmosphere that doesn't react with things. So for example, when people weld metals, oftentimes they'll do that in a helium atmosphere. 
and for growing silicon materials and semiconductor materials, it's also used for that same property. Now, there are some researchers who are suggesting these days that the helium shortage is not only exaggerated, but we're not actually running low. There was a study conducted by researchers at Durham University in the UK suggesting that there are vast sources of it in the western mountains of North America. Well, that would be great if we, you know, have an additional supply that isn't accounted for yet. But even if we have that supply inside the mountains, it's still a finite supply. Sooner or later, if we mine it and then use it and then release it to the atmosphere, it'll also be gone. Well, finally, Ina, how unusual is this element shortage? I mean, Aren't there other things that we're running out of? I'm thinking of easily accessible quantities of things like zinc and copper and platinum, various rare earth elements. I mean, is the helium problem a fundamentally different problem than the one in which, you know, I don't know, I'm going to break into people's homes to steal their copper pipes? (laughs) Well, it is in the sense that copper and platinum will not evaporate out into the atmosphere once it's mined and exposed to air. So in other words, you can lose the helium, but it's harder to lose the platinum. You can always recycle it. Right. Ina Vishik, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me. Ina Vishik is a postdoctoral fellow in physics at MIT. You know, helium has been a sought-after gas for industrial processes for a long time. In the 1930s, the Germans built three giant airships for international travel, and one of these, of course, was the Hindenburg. It was able to carry about 50 passengers in moderately comfortable accommodations from Europe to the United States. We all know what happened to the Hindenburg, suddenly bursting into flame while landing in New Jersey in May 1937. It was filled with highly flammable hydrogen gas, but in fact, the original plan was to fill these dirigibles with non-flammable helium. Now, if they had done that, well, we might not know the story of the Hindenburg because it would have landed safely. Well, why did the Germans not just fill it with helium? Well, unfortunately for the Zeppelin company, the Americans, who controlled most of the world's supply of helium, were wary of the growing Nazi party in Germany and wouldn't sell it to them. Well, our shortage of helium may seem dire now, but it's not the first time an important element has gone bye-bye in large quantities. Surprising new research suggests that the Earth's atmosphere 2.7 billion years ago was half as dense as scientists expected. The case of the disappearing nitrogen next. It's Elements Never Forget on Big Picture Science. Okay, you've got a job to fill and any old online posting just isn't going to do it. You're not simply hunting for candidates. You want someone who will bring value to your organization. Well, with ZipRecruiter, you've got an edge. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't rely on candidates finding you. It finds them. Consider this. Over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. And the process is easy peasy. There's no wrestling with emails and callers. You simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. ZipRecruiter works. It's out there, and it's being used every every day by businesses of all sizes to find the best candidates and quickly. And right now, Big Picture Science listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free, no cost. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. Got it? Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. Okay, it's one thing to have man-made helium shortages. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I take a sip of this dihydrogen monoxide. And it's another to have an element disappear due to ordinary biology. Individual blue-green algae, they're tiny, but when they join their billions of buddies, they're more powerful than market forces in making elements appear and disappear, as they did 
billions of years ago. I'm Roland Pease. I'm a science journalist with a particular interest in the origins of the Earth and the early Earth. And he has two stories to tell us. They involve elements disappearing and appearing in massive quantities. Both stories take us to Australia. There's a region in Australia, in Western Australia, called the Pilbara, which, along with one place in Africa, is the oldest remnant of a continent that's stuck up above the ocean waves. And it's been there now for 3.5 billion years. Thus, the area holds some of the earliest records of life and of the chemical processes related to it. Now, it's not a spoiler to give away the ending to the first story, as it's no surprise to anyone involved in the act of respiration. It is the production of oxygen. But it's still dramatic because prior to 2.3 billion years ago, our atmosphere had almost none. I went to a mine in Australia, absolutely vast mine. It's called Mount Newman. So I actually started off poking up above the ground. And the reason this mine is so interesting is it's just full of rust, iron oxide. And the story behind this rust is that in the ancient, ancient ocean, iron was pouring out into the water but there was no oxygen around to react with it. And so it just sat there until little bits of oxygen leaked out from organisms probably at the bottom of the sea. And suddenly, you know, in a matter of just oof, a few tens of millions of years, all this iron pours out of the ocean, rusts down, settles to the bottom to make an iron ore deposit, which can be mined in the 20th century by guys with big shovels and big machines. But it's absolutely extraordinary how much iron and rust is actually in that mine. And it tells this extraordinary tale of when oxygen first appeared in tiny traces even then in the atmosphere. So it sounds like oxygen was doing to iron billions of years ago what it is doing to our cars today. So anyone who has a car and leaves it outside knows that over time it may rust, and that is the iron combining yeah. with oxygen. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. As ashes to ashes, <laughs> rust to rust, basically. <laughs> so it tells you that at some point oxygen appeared in our atmosphere. When? Do we know when? Well, this is 2.3, 2.4 billion years ago. It's called actually the Great Oxidation Event or even the Great Oxidation Crisis. One geologist I've been with said it was the worst mass poisoning in the planet's history because life up till then was designed to live without oxygen. It was, it was getting on perfectly fine, if you don't mind, doing all kinds of other things. And then suddenly this extraordinarily reactive gas that rusts your car also turns up uh, it was a poison and uh, like often happens with poisons life had to find ways to deal with it it had to find a way to detoxify itself and that's what we sort of call a modern aerobic metabolism once it found a way to get rid of this energetic molecule it suddenly realized hey this, this is actually warming me up this is actually giving me power which i can use to run everything else on my body so organisms which worked out how to use oxygen which ends up with you and me and some plants we like to eat, you know, those things actually suddenly realize this is a way we can get ahead in the game of life. So the great oxidation poisoning event became actually a great moment of opportunity for life. <laughs> well, isn't this uh, all hinge on PR? Because you could call it the great poisoning event, but you could also say that oxygen is a very friendly chemical, that it likes to combine with other molecules and it does so easily. It just likes to pair up. Why well, do you it call depends, it a It depends poison? where you are, Molly. It depends where <laughs> you are. Just imagine if the, the atmosphere was 100% oxygen. This world would be a nightmare world. Either, you know, you go back um, 300 million years when oxygen levels were a few percent higher than they are now. Forest fires were really, really common compared to now. So it's very reactive and it's much more reactive than most of the other gases and reagents that were available to life. So, you know, the, the ones that could use it and control it did really well. I mean, it's the same as the Industrial Revolution. You know, when you could control burning coal, you could actually make bigger steam engines and do lots and lots of work that poor old blokes with a handsaw just couldn't keep up. <laughs> and, and what kind of organisms are we talking about? What was the life form back then that had decided to abandon its old ways of metabolism and, uh, you know, hop on the oxygen train? These weren't 
these weren't four-legged critters, were they? What, what kind of critters were they? There's a lot of argument even goes on about that. But no, it's not. they didn't have four legs, two legs, or uh, even a hundred legs like centipedes. These were... Uh, single-celled organisms, it's pond scum of some sort or other, um, probably the same stuff, similar stuff I should say, to what you have in the ocean today. A lot of our oxygen comes from single-celled organisms in the ocean, soaking up sunlight, breaking down water, capturing carbon dioxide, and has been going on probably for 2.3, probably even maybe 2.8 billion years in some kind of traces. And if these organisms were to enlist their own PR firm, they might say, we prefer not to be called pond scum, but blue-green algae, perhaps? Cyanobacteria? Well, would, but I say it affectionately. <laughs> I like my pond scum. So you can thank that pond scum, you know, the blue-green algae, every time you fill your lungs. Now, it's impressive enough that very simple organisms change the chemical composition of our entire atmosphere once, but twice. In our second story, new research suggests that prior to the arrival of oxygen, algae had an earlier metabolic trick up their sleeves, had they had sleeves. In the basalt flats of Western Australia, scientists have learned something about what Earth's air was like billions of years ago. They examined the size of bubbles that had been trapped in ancient lava flows to determine air pressure way back then. Well, when they did so, scientists were taken aback to discover that the atmosphere in Earth's early years was less than half of what they expected. That means half the atmosphere had gone missing. Right. Well, I told you, Molly, that I've been to this enormous rust pit where the evidence of oxygen came from. I also went to an absolutely vast area of flood basalts. So these are the kinds of basalts that erupt on Hawaii. People also may have heard of the Deccan Traps, which are a massive flood basalt, quite modern one, in uh, India. But these were flood basalts that came out about 2.7 billion years ago. And the great thing is they could actually see that in places some of the basalts had actually erupted under water and other places they had erupted just above water, which meant this was at sea level. That's the only place that could go. And that's um, very important because that means you really are measuring the full weight of the atmosphere above. But the other thing about these basalts is that inside them are these really tiny little bubbles. And the point is this lava before it was erupted was really highly pressured and as it comes up through the ground it actually is basically like uh, taking the cork off a bottle of coke. <laughs> well I actually have a bottle of coke here so we can demonstrate. Okay so I'll just open up this bottle of coke. Okay it was kind of a meager little fizz <laughs> there. Let me just take a sip just to ensure that it is coke. Mm. Okay it is very very bubbly. Now, the bubbles that come out of this, of course, won't be of the early atmosphere. No, what you're actually hearing bubbling up in there is carbon dioxide in this instance, which has been pressurized into the liquid and it's bubbling as it comes out. Now, that's precisely what happened with whatever gases were dissolved in the magma as it erupted. But the important thing, Molly, is that if you were to flash freeze that uh, bottle of soda there so that instantly the whole thing froze over, you would preserve forever the size of those bubbles and the size of those bubbles is determined by the weight of the atmosphere that's above you today that 10 20 kilometers of stuff that's actually weighing down on your moment is also weighing down on those little bubbles in the same way the atmospheric pressure was moving or you know crushing the bubbles as they were trying to emerge and the great thing is that the lava froze quickly within a matter of hours and then late, much later on filled up with some other minerals but it's been kept that way so this is a record which is an indestructible record of atmospheric pressure which you just had to be able to interpret and that's what these scientists have now done. They could compare the bubbles at the bottom which were smaller with the ones at the top which were bigger and then they can work backwards a bit of maths and say hey the atmosphere back in those days was no more than half of what it is today and may actually have been only a quarter and that completely changed their view. They were blown away. One of them said, you know, we just sat there by the campfire that evening and we couldn't believe that this was the answer we were going to get. And the atmosphere was thinner in part because there was half as much nitrogen. And why are we interested in the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere? OK, so th this is for me where it becomes really interesting. So they think that this is an earlier story of pond scum 
transforming the atmosphere, which you know, when you think how big the atmosphere is, that's very extraordinary. And they think that one of the very early inventions of life was to be able to grab this very unreactive molecule, nitrogen, out of the atmosphere and build it into proteins. And it looks like maybe for half a billion years, maybe even a billion years, life had been slowly sucking the nitrogen that was once there out of the atmosphere, drawing it down. And when they died, they fell to the bottom of the sea floor, plate tectonics went and buried them and the nitrogen was gone forever. And that's probably what happened you know, for hundreds of millions of years until those bugs that produce oxygen came along and they reversed the whole process. So for me, this is an extraordinary tale of life twice in about half a billion years transforming the atmosphere of this planet. For me, that um, tells you something astonishing about the power of life. It's the idea that life was so efficient, it actually had to invent the enzymes, which we still depend on to this day, that was sucking the nitrogen on industrial scales out of the atmosphere to keep themselves alive. It just wasn't <laughs> going back into the atmosphere the way it does now. Roland, when the nitrogen was stuck in the bottom of the ocean, as you said, is it is it truly removed from the atmosphere and from the Earth's atmosphere altogether? I mean, I guess I'm wondering if elements can ever be totally destroyed. Elements can't be destroyed. The elements exist forever. Elements that were created in a supernova billions of years ago ended up making our Earth and ended up making you and ended up making the recording equipment. Those elements will never go away. What's really interesting is the chemistry that then follows them. And then what's interesting is the fact that life changes the chemistry of the planet and it changes it on totally monstrous scales. It transforms atmospheres. It makes huge great deposits of iron oxide in the Australian outback. It changes the color of the planet. This is a story of how elements and chemistry combine with life to change planets. Roland Pease, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's an absolute pleasure, Molly. Roland Pease is a science journalist. Remarkable that life eventually was able to use a highly reactive gas like oxygen, but even more that it found a way to grab a less reactive gas like nitrogen and use the atoms in that gas for its own purposes. Well, you know what? I don't know if it's all this talk about atmosphere, but I need some air. And the team clearly needs some refreshment. Usually I just go to the supermarket and pick up Bob's discount imitation ice milk, but Gary and Molly have convinced me that I haven't lived until I try what's being peddled over in Los Altos, where element number seven is helping folks to chill out. Hi, I see your sign says uh, smitten ice cream. Is that because the customers are, are smitten? Yes, it is. And you're? Amber, I'm the chef here. Amber, you're the, you're the chef. You're yes. the one that actually makes this ice cream. Yes. Here. Okay, so we want to order three ice creams, but it's important for my colleagues that they know that the ingredients are locally sourced. I mean, is, is that true? Yes, it's, it's true. We use all organic dairy here, and we get all of our dairy from Breda Farms, so it's, it's local. It's local. Okay, and what are you cooling them down with? I mean, there's all this vapor coming off the pot where the ice cream's getting mixed up. So what we do here is uh, we do something called flash freeze in our ice cream with liquid nitrogen. And basically what happens when we flash freeze it at negative 321 degrees, the ice crystals don't have time to grow. So our ice cream comes out really creamy and smooth. Smaller crystals. Smaller crystals. Better texture. Okay, <laughs> I, I wouldn't like ice cream that had crystals that were, I don't know, as big as my fist. Okay, but you're not using, you know, salted, ice or mechanical refrigeration? No, we are actually using liquid nitrogen. If you look up there, um, you can see the steam coming out. I, I gotta say, looking at all this plumbing, it looks like the inside of a submarine in some sense. It's a big science project. <laughs> Basically, what we're doing is we're separating the liquid from the gas. We only use the liquid part of the liquid nitrogen. And, and minus 321 Fahrenheit? Yes. That sounds cold enough for ice cream. Yes. One use for uh, liquid nitrogen, of course, is for turning bananas into sledgehammers, but I didn't know about making ice cream. Let, let me order here because I've got some hungry colleagues oh, and they're yes, just, yes. and so we want one strawberry white balsamic okay. and an Earl Grey with mixed chocolate chips. Earl Grey, that sounds like it ought to be hot. And for me, uh, can I go for a cookie dough? That sounds... Yes, that's our most popular. Oh, is it? <laughs> yes. So basically what we do is we start off with the base. I make big batches in the back and we, we put them in these, they're called carafes. So it goes in as... She's pouring a carafe, literally a carafe like 
you know, you'd find in the so wine first biz. we add the base for the strawberry and then we add the strawberry compote. And she's adding it all into a big stainless steel cup. She's uh, immersing some spinners into it. All right, so there's all this vapor coming off from this spinning vessel here as the liquid nitrogen goes down there and cools the dairy ingredients, yeah. which, by the way, you said were all locally sourced. But does your liquid nitrogen, I mean, where does it come from? Is that also locally sourced? Um, yes, it is. So, like I said, yeah, if you, you can also look in the back. We have, a, we have a big tank that is back there and basically all these tubes, and it just comes right to the machines here. Of course, you know, that nitrogen, I mean, you know where that nitrogen came from. I mean, it probably came from a really big star that died billions of years ago. I mean, does that worry you? Poor star. No, it doesn't. It, it's, it's, it's going to a good cause here. Everybody loves ice cream. <laughs> okay. If we run out of nitrogen, are you worried about that? I mean, where's all this nitrogen going? Um, so yeah, it evaporates. So it, like, we're only using the liquid. So it basically, as soon as it hits the ice cream, it's just evaporating. You're not worried about breathing those nitrogen no, vapors? we breathe it every day. Yeah, 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 you're okay. You're down with breathing yes. nitrogen. I've been here for two and a half years and I haven't had an injury yet, so. <laughs> no, no adverse nitrogen effects? <laughs> no. Well, okay, and you're also not worried about running out of the stuff? No, we, we never run out of it. Well, I, I can tell you that, the, <laughs> you know, in the universe, the fifth most common element, it's nitrogen. Yes. So, you know, if you work that out, uh, it would be 30 million trillion 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 tons of nitrogen in the part of the universe we could see. So that sounds like a lot of ice cream, but I'm looking forward to this. It's honestly the best ice cream I've ever had. Well, Amber, I'm going to take this back to my colleagues before it all melts. Okay. I, I would hate for it to go from minus 321 Fahrenheit <laughs> to 73 degrees Fahrenheit yes. before they've had a chance. And thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, enjoy your ice cream. It's really good. See, it is good ice cream, Seth. Thanks for picking it up. And it sounds like we probably don't need to put nitrogen on the endangered elements list. Actually, why is that? How is that situation different from helium? We use both of them. Yeah, well, when you release the helium, of course, it's such a light element that it just eventually escapes from the top of the atmosphere and goes into deep space. Nitrogen is almost four times heavier per atom than helium, so the nitrogen sticks around thanks to gravity. Now that you've become even more acquainted with nitrogen and oxygen, let's introduce some new members of the chemical club. Four elements that existed for only a fraction of a second when they were created, but they now have a permanent place in the periodic table. How they were made and their brand new names next. It's Elements Never Forget on Big Picture Science. Some more elementary history, Watson. Hang on a moment here while I shake some sodium chloride on my fries. Hmm, sodium and chlorine. Elements found by the chemist Sir Humphrey Davy about 200 years ago, although even our prehistoric ancestors knew about salt. It was their 19th century descendants, of course, who created a definition for an element as a substance that can't be broken down by chemical means into other substances, a kind of chemical equivalent of a biological species and began identifying them. Neon, cesium, molybdenum. Some new ones were found by just digging in the dirt and naming them after the place where the dirt was, like yttrium. Over time, chemists filled the gaps in the periodic table, but only recently has the table achieved symmetry with four new elements filling out the seventh and the last row. Not found in dirt, they were created by the white lab coat crowd. My name is Mark Stoyer. I work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and a member of the team that's responsible for the discovery and naming of elements 115, 117, and 118. Not even the mighty oxygen belching or nitrogen metabolizing cyanobacteria could churn out super heavy elements 113, 115, 117, and 118. It took atom smashers years to produce one atom of each. A trio of research institutions produced these smashing results. The Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Russia, 
Tennessee's Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory here in California. And like any prideful parents, those that participated in the creation were given naming rights. Hey, and I was just getting attached to the name Anuntrium. Okay, we'll find out how these elements were made, how they hold clues to locating something called the Island of Stability, where some isotopes of super heavy elements don't disappear in a flash. Also, what the heck does it mean to call elements super heavy, and would they take offense? Well, Mark, there is an update on the discovery of these four new elements. They've been given proper names, and so let's introduce them. Sure. And um, how about I give the generic placeholder name, Okay. Okay. and then you can tell us what the new name is, or the provisional name is, and why. Okay. Okay. There are four of them. The first is element 113, Ununtrium. Yes, quite a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and element 113 is uh, now named Nihonium, Nihonium. its provisional name, Nihonium, and it was named by our Japanese uh, colleagues at Riken. Nihonium is based on Nihon, which is one of the couple ways that they say their country's name in Japanese, so it means Japan. The next one is element 115, an unpentium. An unpentium, yes, that's element 115, which we chose Moscovium for the name. Moscow? And named after Moscow? It's named after the region, actually. The region in the country of Russia in which the laboratory exists. All right, two more. One is element 117, an unseptium, which yes. sounds like something that you might cure. Might, with some antibiotics. Right, but sure, something like that. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So that's element 117. Um, we chose to name that Tennessee. It's named after the state. And where Oak Ridge and National Laboratory is. It's where Oak Laboratory Ridge is. National Laboratory is. We also have colleagues at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, mm -hmm. we have one more, but first, why do they all begin with un? because that's the Latin for number one. <laughs> so basically, un un septium is just spelling out 117 in Latin. Ah, so then yeah. this one, un un octium. Is 118, is element 118. Its new name is now Oganesson, named after Yuri Oganesian, who is the leader of our collaboration, the scientific leader of our collaboration. Well, the reason we're here discussing these names, and it's interesting in itself, is because these new elements and these new names have been added to the periodic table. And it's gotten scientists, certainly you, um, but others and members of the public really excited. And cool, yes. It is cool. <laughs> Why is this an exciting moment? I think they're excited because so many are coming on the periodic table at the same time. Four is very unusual. I think they're excited because it, as people have said, finishes off the seventh row of the periodic table. It's kind of symmetric now. Less like Swiss cheese. Less like Swiss cheese. It's exciting because we don't really know where the end of the periodic table is. It's one of the big questions. How far can you go? How many more elements are there? What are the limits of chemical stability? Now, the... The elements that you and the other teams discovered or created very mm -hmm. quickly, which word would you prefer? Um, we synthesized them. We made them in the lab. <laughs> we made them for an instant. They don't last very long. So if we weren't approaching this island of stability, we wouldn't have been able to observe them. They wouldn't have lasted long enough for us to see. They're also characterized as super heavy elements. What's a super heavy element? Um, <laughs> it's one of the okay so there are a variety of definitions for super heavy elements why are you laughing at that uh, well i'm laughing because it's just at the very end of the periodic table we we had heavy elements we we called the act some of the actinides heavy elements so the next name after that was just super heavy elements they're, they're extra heavy they're beyond um some of the heavy elements and it means it just means that they're heavy <laughs> What does it mean to be heavy? Um, it means that they have... Um, I mean, lead, um, lead have, is heavy, right? Lead is, lead is... Okay, so lead is dense. Oh. Lead is a material that is dense. You can gather a bunch of lead atoms together, and you can feel that it's heavy, but it's, but it's dense. 
these, what it means is super heavy elements, means they have the most number of protons in the nucleus, right? So if we talk about the, the numbers, so numbers 113, elements 113 through 118, they have the most number of protons in the nucleus. Well, you and your colleagues made new elements, which raises the question of which elements need to be created or synthesized mm -hmm. in the lab and which ones are found in nature and why? Okay. So the more general thing is that um, beyond element 92, roughly, the elements just decay they don't have a an isotope that is very 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 long lived or stable this this island of stability so part of the reason for doing this for trying to make new elements isn't just to make oh the next new element it's to explore the landscape of neutrons and protons and what combinations are going to be stable what combinations aren't going to be stable there is a, has been a long-standing prediction since the 1960s of this island of stability. It's a region in the proton-neutron space in which the isotopes have extra stability. They may live for hundreds of years, maybe even longer. That's much longer than a millisecond. It's much, much longer than a millisecond. <laughs> it's much longer than what we're seeing at the moment. But we're not on the center of the island. And that's the point. We're kind of on the uh, western side of the island of stability, if you want to use... Um, the western shore, the beach. Western shore, the beach, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would assume metaphors help a lot when you're discussing some of these abstract ideas, or at least when you're talking about um, dimensions that are very, very, very small. Right. You're, you're exactly right. So we call it the island of stability. It's really just a region in the chart of protons and neutrons. When you mm -hmm. think of chemistry, nuclear mm -hmm. chemistry, and, and you do the work that you do to synthesize new elements mm -hmm. or study the elements, do you think in pictures? Do you picture it? Do you picture the um, atomic world in your mind? There's a lot There's a lot of that, yes. We, we perform but, nuclear reactions. But so you we personally, I mean, you personally, do you have a visual image of this subatomic world? I, I have my own particular image. It may, um, it helps me in the research that I do to, to figure out what might be a good reaction to use, for example. What's that um, image? <laughs> it's probably not a, a conventional one, but I like to think in terms of, if you think about colliding billiard balls or things like that, think about sticky billiard balls, because what we really are doing is we're we're taking one element, one nucleus of one element, and colliding it into another nucleus of another element, and hoping we get them to stick together and gradually decay so we can detect the, the decay is actually how we detect these synthesized new elements. They have so a particular fingerprint. The billiard balls are the nuclei, right. and right. inside the nuclei are the um, inside neutrons, the bill inside uh, the neutrons and protons. Inside right. the billiard mm -hmm. balls would be the neutrons and the protons. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's talk more about the new elements. Sure. Um, now, the new elements again are. I'll just give them the atomic number instead of the names of uh, one thirteen, one fifteen, one seventeen, and one eighteen. But two other elements, one was livermorium, mm -hmm. 116, and then fluorovium, fluorovium mm -hmm. 114, were already there. Mm -hmm. So why have there been holes? Why don't you find these elements in order 113, 114, yep. 115, and so on? Right. It's, it's easier to make some elements than it is to make other elements. It just comes down to that. The amount of time that you have to use to, to make a particular element depends on its nuclear structure, how many protons and how many neutrons it has in the nucleus. Well, what's interesting is the amount of time that goes into synthesizing these elements is mm -hmm. disproportionate to the fleeting results. So you conduct highly sophisticated experiments over months, perhaps mm -hmm. years, to create elements that last for a fraction of seconds or less than a second. And it's just one atom that you're creating of each element and it's through a nuclear reaction right. and can you just describe how you do that so a, a nuclear reaction is one in which you're combining two nuclei combining cells so 
so Grinding gentle, sounds it's easy. more smashing, aren't you? Right. <laughs> so when I talk with students, I say, do you think you can just do this by, you know, I made a cup of tea earlier. Do you think you can just do it by pouring a couple elements together and swishing it around and they all come to the concept? Well, no, that doesn't. Because you're trying to combine two nuclei which are positively charged. So it'd be as if the tea bag did not want to be dropped into the water and was right. holding on to the edge repelled. of the cup. And yeah, it, it was just <laughs> like, I don't want to go in the water, I'm just getting, getting away. So you have to put a lot of energy into it. You really have to ram it down there with your spoon, right? <laughs> this uh, idea is that we uh, accelerate one of the nuclei and smash it into another nucleus. Well, that gets okay. an idea of how sophisticated, but why does it take months or years to do that? Because most of the time we plain miss. Because remember, there's a nucleus, which is extremely tiny in the center of an atom. And then the atom is surrounded by a cloud of electrons. So when you combine and make a target of material, there are atoms. So most of that target is actually empty space or where the electrons are moving. So when you're trying to throw one tiny little nucleus at another tiny little nucleus, most of the time you miss. We throw 10 to the 19, that's one followed by 19 zeros, projectiles at a combination of targets, target atoms that are number in that same kind of order and most of the time we plain miss. And you're looking at a screen. I mean, all of this looking shows at a up screen, on a screen. It's looking at a lot of numbers, a particular sequence of signals. I have a follow up as to how this was done. You said you're smashing mm -hmm. different atoms together. Now, if this is a numbers game in some ways, I wonder if you can do. I, I'm pretty sure you can't, but I'm going to ask this anyway. If you could do any old math to get the number of protons that you're after. So why not take iron, which has an atomic number of 26, and add it to francium, which has an atomic number of 87, and then you get 113. Or why not mm -hmm. just take 113 helium atoms and I'll try to smash them all together? Okay. Well, the second <laughs> second part is it's it's, ex as I told you, it's extremely difficult to get two nuclei to collide at the same time. But my logic now, is, is logic solid is, up to the point is, where it doesn't work. It's right? solid up to the point of the technical issues. Okay. Of trying to get, you know, 13 nuclei to collide or 100 nuclei to collide at the same time, it's extremely difficult to do. So that immediately limits you to two, trying to get two to collide together. Now, you can use more symmetric reactions like you suggested. That means the projectile and the target are closer together in their element numbers, in their numbers of protons and neutrons. Or you can go more asymmetric, where you use very light on a very heavy projectile, some of which are more stable and some of which are less stable. So it comes back to this question of stability. So it comes back to the question of stability. In our case, we wanted to pick a reaction that would give us the most number of neutrons in the nucleus in the, when we finished with our reaction. We used calcium-48, which is the most neutron-rich, stable isotope of calcium. And let's pick curium. We used curium-248 because it had a lot of neutrons in it, okay? Now, the example that you use, Say, say it again, I know francium was the target. Because and... it's probably never been suggested in all <laughs> well, of science before, so I'll re repeat it. Uh, it was iron, iron uh, 26 and francium. and francium 87, just because yeah. those numbers added so up to 113. Those add up to 113. The, the problem is, one, francium is radioactive, so getting a target of it may or may not be possible. That's one technical uh, issue. The other is they're more symmetric. What I said, they're, they're closer together in, in size. So they're, they're becoming more and more similar. And what that means is you will populate a portion of the chart of the nuclides that is less neutron rich um, than the region in which we're, we're landing. So there's more to it than just the math. <laughs> there's, there's trying to pick a reaction that will actually produce something, you know, in a reasonable length of time. <laughs> what was it like to be in the lab when one of these was detected? Was it a yippee, yeehaw, eureka moment? Is that how it unfolds? No, it don't, generally it doesn't. It takes us a while to realize that something eureka, you know, happened. 
we have to check and make sure that we're not being fooled by some spurious signals, for example. Do you have a moment of celebration? And what does that look like? Does anyone? <clears throat> it's typically an email that goes back an and email. forth between the collaboration <laughs> that says, congratulations, you know, we found an atom of this or uh, yeah. And please take a look here. Did you see this decay chain? It's not... Um, the bottle of champagne. It's not the bottle of champagne, the cork hitting the ceiling and everything. <laughs> Mark Stoyer, thank you so much for coming in today and speaking with us. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Mark Stoyer is a nuclear chemist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So the elements, some were born in an atom smasher and most were born in the stars. Some disappear in a flash, but most will hang out for at least another 10,000 billion billion years. The nature of an element is fixed, but its quantity can sometimes change drastically. Just ask the cyanobacteria. Well, it's elementary. We couldn't do this show without the production help of Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the episode Elements Never Forget. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find lots of episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because, you know, there's always an element of risk that static will drown out the show, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen to our show via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, just be sure to throw in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship, and they've been taken hold of down on the field by a number of men. The Zeppelin has landed safely. Another ho-hum day here in New Jersey. Oh, the banality!